thank you for the introduction. Thank you for uh, asking me to come talk to you guys tonight. You guys seem like a really active chapter, and I know you guys up there in Boulder have had a pretty rough year, so it's an honor to come and talk to you guys tonight. Um, uh, well, like I said, I'm Anna Cordova. My official title, I work for the City of Colorado Springs. I work under our Parks, Recreation, and Cultural Services Department. Um, my official title is the lead archaeologist, but I always joke that I'm the only one, so not really sure who I'm leading, but I'm doing a good job so far of at least leading myself here. Um, so you guys are pretty probably well aware of some of the, uh, well, the fact that there's not a whole lot of city archaeologists, but Boulder is the only other one that has a municipal archaeologist. And after talking with uh, Katie and Christian, I understand that our roles are a little bit different. And of course, our cities are set up a little bit differently too in the park system. Um, so my role as city archaeologist is fairly broad. Um, I'll talk a little bit uh, later about kind of why I was hired. Um, I'm going to really go over one big project that we did. Um, some of you may have heard a little bit about the Palmer Midden project, so I'm going to go over that. We're going to talk a little bit about another excavation at Garden of the Gods Park, and then I'll tell you a little bit more about some of the other projects that I'm currently working on or that I've worked on recently and what's kind of upcoming. Um, so my role as city archaeologist with Colorado Springs um, is fairly varied, but kind of in general, I think the idea of hiring me in the first place was to assess the cultural and archaeological resources of our parks and open space. So I know Boulder has a lot of acreage of open space and parks. Um, we've got over 6,000 acres of, of open space and trails, uh, probably even more than that now because we're, we're always acquiring new properties. We have a special program called the TOPS program. And that was voted in about 20 years ago um, where we take a tenth of a percent of city sales tax and it goes toward per, uh, purchasing, preserving, and stewarding um, open spaces for the city of Colorado Springs. So we've got parks um, up to the mountains. We also um, have um, roles with like say the, the forest service, like the summit of Pikes Peak is owned by the forest service, but is managed by the city. Um, so we're involved in a lot of those types of things as well. But we've, so we've got it from the top of Pikes Peak all along the front range, of course, all throughout the city and then even way out to the east. So I'll talk a little bit about our furthest east property too called Corral Bluffs. Um, but it's my, my general job is kind of to just figure out what we've got and how we can preserve it. Of course, that's a big job. Um, I think the latest stats are that only about 2% of properties in Colorado are have actually been surveyed um, by archaeologists. So uh, really, some of the properties that we have before I became city archaeologist, I was hired in 2016. So I've been here about five and a half years, um, has been to figure out what we've already gotten uh, surveyed, what we need to to be doing. And, and those are often dictated by what kind of projects are going on. So if a park property is not really being impacted or changed, then, you know, obviously that doesn't call my attention so much. Um, probably the most of my work is what the, the park that keeps me the most busy is Garden of the Gods Park. And I'll talk about that in a little bit too. Um, I also um, really work to train fellow Parks and Rec employees and volunteers and even a little bit the general public how to recognize archaeological sites. And it's especially important for our people that work in the parks. So, um, you know, our, our park rangers that are cleaning up and things um, like to pick up trash, but I always like to tell them if it's older than 50 years, don't pick it up until you talk to me first. So um, it's, it's, I do quite a few trainings. We have a lot of seasonal employees too. And I have my little box of, of artifacts that I take out um, and use as some of the most commonly found artifacts that we find. Um, how to tell how old, say, like a, a glass bottle is or things like that. Um, and then, you know, the most common kind of lithic materials that we find, stuff like that. Just trying to give people a general idea of what they're looking for, what they should try to avoid, and then how to contact me if they need to do that, um, if they do find things. And so, I, and that that seems to be working pretty well. Um, and then also just talking to 
to, to the designers and, and people who are developing the parks, um, like say putting in new trails and things like that. Um, going ahead and, you know, doing quick little surveys ahead of time if if we haven't already looked at that area to, to make sure that we're not impacting any archeological sites with our new trails and things. Uh, I do a lot of public archeology, span so I give quite a few lectures. Um, this one is not really the first time. I altered it a little bit for you guys, but, um, you know, I, I do quite a few uh, lectures and things like that. I also go to schools and talk to kids and stuff. Um, a lot of people don't know, but um, our probably biggest museum here is the Colorado Springs Pioneers Museum, and that is actually under Parks and Rec. So, uh, like I said, we're Parks, Recreation, and Cultural Services. So I work in the Cultural Services Division. So my direct supervisor is the director of the museum, who's also the manager of the Cultural Services Division. Um, so I work with the museum a lot um, to do presentations and put on programs and teach people about archaeology and what you do if you find it and, um, you know, just get people interested and invested in archaeology and why we need to be good stewards of it. Um, I'm also really heavy on the tribal consultation. Of course, some of our projects, the federal agencies that are involved um, need to do the, are required to do the tribal consultation under section 106 but i also do quite a bit of tribal consultation outside of that and we just do it because we think it's ethical and right to do so like say anytime we're doing anything in garden of the gods park uh, we have an agreement with the southern ute that we'll have somebody there to monitor it um, we let them know about projects even if they don't have a federal nexus that might impact places that they're um, that they care about um, so that's a, that's a big thing that we do as well. And we do that um, for like the museum exhibits that we're coming up with and things like that as well. Um, and then, like I said, just like general mitigation, there's lots of, you know, meetings with construction contractors and things like that about, um, or like say city engineering, if they wanna do a project that's gonna impact the park, um, helping coordinate with the federal agencies and tribes and things like that, um, surveying ahead of times. Uh, there's quite a bit of monitoring that goes on. And then once in a while, I actually get to excavate too. So, oops, what did I do? Oh, there we go. <clears throat> so the Camp Creek Maiden Project. Um, this is the one that, um, uh, let's see, Alpine Archaeology, FEMA, and the City of Colorado Springs recently, last year, got the State Archaeologist Award for... Um, for, that was the that was the this was the project that she that she picked um, the Camp Creek Midden project also known as the the Palmer Midden project. Um, so one of the big reasons this is in front this is in Garden of the Gods actually at the very northeast corner. I know not all of you are probably super familiar with Colorado Springs, but Garden of the Gods is uh, our most visited park. It is about thirteen hundred acres, um, known for its really big red rock formations. Um, similar to Roxborough State Park, um, but it's it's got quite a few, um, well, lots and lots of visitors. We get almost 6 million visitors a year, which is almost as, the same as the Grand Canyon, um, except the Grand Canyon has national park funding, and we've got city funding, and we have really three full-time employees that, that manage the managing care for the park. So, um, it's one of those parks that's kind of being loved to death and there's always things going on. Um, and so one of the reasons that I was hired um, in 2016 was kind of a catalyst was the, the Waldo Canyon fire, the, the picture right here. And then we had flooding the year after that. And um, just, out, just north and west of Garden of the Gods Park um, is Queens Canyon. And the fire came right up to the edge of Garden of the Gods Park. And the, the flooding that happens that was happening was really affecting Queens Canyon and the neighborhood that's south of the park. And so after those fires and flooding um, in general in the city, we were getting quite a bit of uh, federal funding for a bunch of different projects. And that was, of course, triggering the Section 106 process and not having an archaeologist was was they were they were seeing more and more the need for an archaeologist. And so that was one of the catalysts. Um, for my being hired. Um, so the Camp Creek project was started because they were putting drop structures along Camp Creek. Camp Creek runs in front of Garden of the Gods Park. Um, it's, um, 
like I said, it leads into a neighborhood. And so it comes out of the mouth of Queens Canyon and then goes through Garden of the Gods Park and then enters a neighborhood. Well, the flooding was really causing some issues. So they wanted to put drop structures in the creek itself. And then they also wanted to put a large 17 acre detention pond at the north east side of the park right there along the creek to, to hold water for 48 hours and let it go. But it was meant as mitigation for that to save that neighborhood further down in case of you know future flooding and things like that. Um, there was nowhere else to put it. And so um, this is the only spot they could put it to kind of save that neighborhood. So I was hired, like I said, in June of 2016. In September, I started monitoring at the request of the tribes, um, the drop structures that they were putting along the creek. So the drop structures is the picture right here, down in the lower left corner, um, are just like these U-shaped formations that they put in the creek to kind of slow the flow of the water as it goes down the creek. And that was ahead of the large detention pond they were putting in. That involved um, two federal agencies, the park and the, I'm sorry, the, the detention pond and the drop structures. I was monitoring there um, when they kind of wore some of the vegetation away um, right in the area that they were gonna put the large detention pond. Um, it had been previously surveyed um, by a company um, where they were trying to get ahead of the Section 106 process. So that was, it was, I think it was surveyed in 2012 um, and 2013. Uh, they did notice a site there, right there where they're going to put the detention pond, but the vegetation was so thick, um, turns out they couldn't see the whole thing. I could see the whole, well, I could see a much bigger portion of it once they wore away a bunch of the, uh, the grass and the vegetation right there trying to access the creek for the drop structures. So I'm just kind of monitoring here and there, coming in and out, and I notice that the site that they called um, an ineligible, so not eligible for the National Register of Historic Places, a, a trash gather. They thought it was maybe from like early 1900s. Um, they didn't. They didn't record it as being very big. They did put one shovel test in, and it turns out they happened to put it kind of on the edge of the site. They didn't catch a whole lot of artifacts. And so, as I was um, monitoring there and noting that I was seeing more and more artifacts as they wore, wore more vegetation away. Um, I started to notice that some of the artifacts were were kind of uh, unique, um, just spoke maybe to a little bit a higher socioeconomic status. You know, we see little trash scatters, you know, all over Colorado, of course, and this one just seemed a little bit bigger than they had thought it was. And I wanted to watch. They, the detention pond was going to be such a, there's going to be a gap between when they did the drop structures and the detention pond. And so, they were gonna reseed it. So that's what they're doing in this picture right here. I told them I wanted to come and watch as they reseeded that little access road that they made there to see if they pulled up anything significant. They were only pulling up a few inches of dirt just to loosen the ground to put the seed down. Um, and within about, oh, 15 feet of them doing that, uh, we had them stop because they pulled out a whole lot of uh, really unique things. So like I said, this is just in the first few inches of dirt um, this is just in the first like 15 feet of them loosening that soil. And you can see here, lots of whole bottles popped up right away. I haven't seen a whole lot of whole bottles. In fact, I don't think I've ever seen a fully intact bottle in more than a handful of, of sites. Um, and on this site, they're right within that first 15 feet of soil they were pulling up. They probably found at least 10 bottles. Um, this in the top picture here on the right hand side, there's this little blue bottle. A construction worker actually pulled that up before we started um, loosening that soil. And it's it was a Bromo seltzer bottle from 1889. Uh, I started seeing all kinds of Worcestershire bottles, um, a couple whiskey bottles, lots of mineral water, medicine bottles. But again, this is just in that really small area. So the, the artifacts are really dense. They just weren't buried very far down either. Um, I also started seeing things that I didn't recognize. Um, context is everything too. So I talked about Queens Canyon and we're kind of at the mouth of Queens Canyon along Camp Creek. Queens Canyon is where General William Jackson Palmer who lived from 1871 up until he passed away in 1909. Um, he is the founder of the city of Colorado Springs. He was a 
very well off because he had stock in the, the railroads. Um, he was a Civil War veteran. Um, really hugely important guy in Colorado history, but especially Colorado Springs history. Um, and being right outside the canyon where he had his his castle built, there's actually, you know, his mansion is, is we'll call it uh, the Palmer Castle. Um, he lived there starting in 19, or I'm sorry, 1871 uh, with his wife. They ended up having three daughters there. They had a whole estate where they had stables and, you know, other families living there to take care of the gardens and all kinds of other things. Um, the Camp Creek Valley that we're in right here on this site, um, he had a whole pipeline system. He started a school for the little um, the children that lived in that little area because they were still quite a ways away from Colorado Springs itself at the time. Um, so he's obviously, you know, a huge important guy in Colorado Springs, but um, I started seeing things that spoke to really high socioeconomic status and, you know, that kind of gave me an uh-oh right away. Um, we were seeing a lot of this blue on white stuff, which can be pretty common, um, but I had never seen things like this. So this little dish down here in the bottom right corner turned out to be a relish tray. I did not know what it was for quite some time. Uh, it's the only relish tray I've ever seen. Um, it has a re really great maker's mark on the back. This right here with my foot in the picture is a dry cell battery. So uh, I put my foot there so you could see how big it is. It's, it's you know, this big chunk of cement and it had this kind of petroleum looking stuff um, on the top. It still smelled like really oily and everything. I had no idea what it was when I first found it. Um, it didn't take a whole lot of research to figure out it was a dry cell battery, but um, and then this this brick down here is an enameled brick. I've never seen enameled bricks in any other archaeological context. Um, still haven't. Um, there were other bricks on site, um, some that were being manufactured in Pueblo, some that were being manufactured in Colorado Springs itself, and they had great maker's marks. But this one says Chicago on one side and Tiffany on the other. So again, this high socioeconomic status, right? Like who the bottles were giving me really good dates from like the 1870s up through about the very, very early 1900s, just looking at them on the ground at this time they pulled, when they pulled them out that day. Um, but it was really the other artifacts that, that were speaking to, you know, who has dry cell batteries at that time? Who's going to have enamel bricks when you have bricks, you know, already right here? So someone is, is pretty well off that has all this trash over here. So of course I had to prove it. I had to tie it to Palmer. We were also finding uh, little pieces of light bulbs and things like that that had uh, the parts of filament. It's still intact inside a little piece of glass inside that had serial numbers from the 1880s. You know, nobody on that side of town would have had electricity in the 1880s or even probably the 1890s. Um, again, Garden of the Gods is probably two to three miles away from what was Colorado Springs at the time. So, um, we had some people speculate that maybe it was people coming and dumping their, their trash off to the side of the road, um, but they would have had to travel pretty far in order to do that. So of course, logically, it th we thought maybe it was Palmer's, but we had to tie it to Palmer. So that proved pretty easy. Um, Glen Erie is now managed, Glen Erie is, is um, Palmer's estate. It is now managed by the Navigators, which is a Christian missionary organization. Um, and they take really good care of the property. It's open for like teas and you can stay there. You can stay in Palmer's bedroom if you have to, if you want to. Um, I don't think I want to do that, but you can if you want to. Um, you can get married there. They have conferences there. Um, and, but they have their own historians too. And so I wanted to bring some of these artifacts that I found over to Glen Erie and see if any of them look familiar to them. Right before I walked out the door to do that, um, I looked up the enameled brick. And so I put in... Uh, I figured out that it was from the uh, and Tiffany Enameled Brick Company in Chicago. Um, so I put that company name in. I put in Colorado Springs and Palmer just to see what would pop up. And luckily for me, some history nerd like myself put in had put this um, document right here into Google Docs. So they had scanned this. The Brick Builder and Architectural Monthly from January 1904. Uh, 1904 happens to be the date that for a while, from 1871 to 1904, Palmer had a really nice house in Glen Erie and stable and all those things. But in 1904 is when he started building the castle. Um, luckily for me, this document um, popped up and it went right to this page right here where 
it's talking about here toward the, the bottom left, it says the Tiffany Enamel Brick Company reports a steady growth in demand for their satin finished bricks. So it's a it's a catalog for brick builders to advertise what they've got and what they're making. Um, at the top on the right there, if you can read it, it says their bricks are being used in the following new, new buildings. As you go down the list here in the middle, the highlighted in blue, uh, it says General William J. Palmer Residence, Glen Erie, Colorado Springs, Colorado. So that was a that was a pretty well, a pretty strong tie, right? I don't know that you find such strong ties a lot of times in archaeology, but we got lucky with that one. Um, when I took them to Glen Erie, they told me, oh yeah, he's he was using those. Um, they lined the wall of the the bowling alley, which was in the basement of his castle. So he had all those satin bricks lining the wall of the, the bowling alley there. He also had um, them, those satin bricks were, ma they made up his electrical house. So he was generating his own electricity starting in about 1904. So speaking of electricity, these down here, kind of the ratty looking ones that aren't complete, are the ones I found on site. You can see the piece of paper still intact. Like I said, it still had the serial numbers and the patent dates from the 1880s um, written on those and you could easily read them. Um, so I took those over there and they pulled out this fully intact, pristine one that was still in the original box. And you can see the piece of paper in there too. Um, of course, it's the same base and everything, the same piece of glass on the inside. And this piece of paper had the same serial numbers and the same patent dates. So again, there's another really strong connection. Um, the dry cell battery was also um, really significant. Um, when I brought that over to them, uh, Donald McGilchrist, their historian, had this one already sitting on his desk. So it was originally wrapped in cardboard, but it was a dry, dry cell battery. I think the patent date says April 11th, 1896. So they were telling me that, you know, not only was he generating his own electricity and had a bowling alley and all these things, he also had electric gates starting in about 1904. So these batteries were powering the electric gates of that General Palmer had. So, so it's, it's definitely Palmer, right? Like there's, there's no denying that it's Palmer. This is right outside the mouth of the canyon. Uh, we can see evidence that he was burning the trash as well. Um, you're not going to burn it in the canyon, smoke yourself out. Um, the thing to do is to dump it next to a creek at the time and kind of let it wash away. And so that seems to be what he was doing as well. Um, so now that we know that it's Palmer's, then of course we all had to scramble to figure out uh, what we're going to do to mitigate it ahead of the building of that detention pond. So of course we had to change the eligibility status because it had been um, listed as not eligible for the National Register. Um, we had to then test, there are actually two sites. So we're, we're right next to Camp Creek in this picture. They're excavating right next to Camp Creek. Camp Creek actually cut into the site. Um, and then further close to this ridge up here, I don't know if you guys can see my mouse, but um, close to the ridge up here, there's another site that they had also said was not an eligible site. And that turned out to be Palmer's as well. Um, so we needed to test both sites and define their boundaries. So um, I was working with um, the State Historic Preservation Office and of course Holly Norton um, pretty closely. And then FEMA was, NRCS was the project that had impacted this site. So there was some mitigation that they needed to do for that. FEMA was the one that wanted to help us build the detention pond and that's where our funds were coming from. So I started working with uh, Charlie Bellow, he's the archeologist for FEMA in this district. And then of course I'm one archeologist, so I can't do all this work on my own. And so uh, we hired Alpine Archeological um, to come in and help us do this, do this project. And so uh, we all kind of worked collaboratively to write up a treatment plan and come up with some uh, questions that we wanted to ask of the archeology. span um, And so we were able to test the sites get those boundaries, um, and then we were able to excavate, and then we needed to, of course, analyze and interpret and then curate all these things. So um, all these artifacts are now at the Colorado Springs Pioneers Museum. Uh, I think we ended up pulling out, uh, well, over 60,000 artifacts, I'll say. Um, I don't tell a whole lot of people this, um, but, you know, of course, we only, we only want to sample the sites. We couldn't possibly excavate all of the sites. The one site that they're actually excavating right here 
was almost the length of a football field. Uh, the other one is about two thirds that size. So this is all of Palmer's trash and his estate that was being dumped there from 1871 up until the 19 teens when his daughter sold the property. We even have a little bit of the owners afterwards that were there in the 1920s. Um, but it's it's uh, really dense. Like I, I can't overemphasize that enough. I know that when they did the the test excavations, they were really uh, astounded with how many artifacts they were pulling out of like one test unit. Um, we sampled less than 2% of, uh, if we're looking at both sides combined, uh, we, we sampled less than 2%, which was still 80 test units, so 81 by ones. Um, and we still came out with over 65,000 artifacts. So that was a, that was a lot. And it was a kind of a headache trying to figure out how we were going to curate and and do all these things on a on a timeline of course too so that we could build that detention pond because like i said there was nowhere else to put it and then of course we need to do the public interpretation which is something that's still ongoing so some of the questions we really wanted to ask of this site um, were you know we want to look at the basic questions of can we see gender and ethnicity age socioeconomic status was pretty obvious from the beginning um, can we see anything about religion and also, can we bust some of the myths that there are about that we already had about Palmer? <clears throat> so there's a lot of myths about Palmer. Uh, he was a Quaker, and so people were, um, he founded Colorado Springs as a dry town. And so we wanted to look and see, uh, I think people who really knew Palmer, and especially like the people at the Pioneers Museum, um, already knew that he wasn't necessarily anti-alcohol himself. He just, it was purely for economic reasons that he didn't want the city to, uh, to have alcohol and, and become one of those towns. He wanted to be a high-end town. He wanted to draw people from Europe and the East Coast to come here. Um, and he was really trying to model it kind of off of some people call it Little London. So we also wanted to ask really specific questions about um, his estate, not just Palmer and his family, but see if we could see some of his estate as well. Um, so yeah, we wanted to see if we could tell if there were any different dumping episodes um, and if we could see his change in wealth over time. And we actually uh, were able to see that pretty clearly. The site that's closer to the ridge and it's closer to Glen Erie um, turned out to be an earlier site. So you can see that he's definitely very well off um, on that site, but the site closer to the creek that we're looking at here, and look at that great stratigraphy, it looks like chocolate mousse cake to me, but um, we wanted to see if we could see that change in wealth, and because we had two separate sites, uh, we could see that pretty easily, um, and and two, this isn't a floodplain, so the, the, the preservation was really great, but we see that, you know, he's definitely wealthy on the earlier site, but the opulence, and we'll talk a little bit about that in some of these other artifacts over here. Um, the opulence definitely increases as time goes on. So we see more kind of fancier trash um, later on. So which residents of the estate are, are represented at the site? Um, we see, like I said, in a floodplain, but we still have things like this piece of the American Florist Weekly publication from June of 1907. Um, he was really big on gardening, um, and he had a huge greenhouse that actually Parks and Rec moved many years ago and still uses for our greenhouse and for growing a lot of the plants that we that we um, put in our parks. Um, so we can see evidence of some of the gardening. There were terracotta pots. Um, we got some pollen samples um, looking at kind of the things that he was growing. Uh, we see alfalfa and all kinds of other stuff. This tree right here... Um, in the top left over here. Uh, it's not looking so pretty now and you can't see it on there, but it has the word melon, M-E-L-L-E-N. That was his wife. His wife's nickname was Queen. Um, that was Queen's maiden name, Melon. And we know that her family lived on the estate for several years too. So he was kind of supporting some of his in-laws for quite a while um, and actually built them in a new house a little bit further south um, that's still there and is still a really cool historic uh, property. Um, but that's pretty specific, right? Um, if we needed any more further connection to Palmer, that's another one. Um, so that's a that's a fun artifact. Um, we were looking also at maybe some gender and things like that. Um, so we get these, you know, buttons, pieces of combs, uh, bottle stopper, um, 
Palmer actually, when he was founding Colorado Springs <clears throat> and setting up the city, before he hired police officers or anybody else for the city, the first position that he created was a forester. So like a lot of the front range towns, you know, there weren't a whole lot of trees up until you got to the mountains. In fact, it was pretty much plains up until you got up to the foothills of the mountains real close. Um, so one of his big goals was to plant trees. And um, so here you see a little tree cleat um, used to climb trees. So maybe that speaks to some of the people that were living with him and doing some of the work for him. Um, some of the artifacts were, of course, pretty easy to link to the main house as well, not just the bricks and things like that. But we see, you know, these are pictures that I took when I did my little personal tour of the castle. Um, you can go take a tour of the castle now, too, if you'd like. Um, I should have included a picture of the castle from the outside. It's pretty impressive. Um, but this is one of the main bathrooms when you first walk into the castle um, in kind of the lobby there. Um, and you can see that, of course, the tile matches pretty, pretty clearly. Um, this bathroom right here with a little toilet and those puzzle tiles is actually um, Palmer's bathroom from his bedroom. And you can see some of the example of the puzzle tiles we found on site that match pretty well. Um, we also found quite a few fragments of tile from the fireplaces and things like that. And, and we found some that are specific to Palmer's bedroom himself too. So those personal connections to Palmer are pretty neat. Uh, like I said, there's a lot of myths about Palmer. The, the biggest one being that um, he was anti-alcohol and, and, you know, was, was a Quaker and was very religious. Um, so we wanted to see, you know, what kind of vices can we see on the site? Um, it doesn't necessarily, of course, mean that, that Palmer was drinking or smoking. Like there's some little, an, Egypt, an Egyptian cigarette liner, um, some tobacco paraphernalia. Um, maybe it's some of the people on his estate that were doing that, but um, I think he was probably someone who probably liked a good cigar after dinner. Um, we know that he was, he was serving alcohol at some of his functions. Uh, we see where he had functions and gatherings where everybody is, is raising a champagne glass or a glass of wine. So we weren't surprised to find, you know, this slow gin bottle. This originally had the collar around it still. It said slow gin. Um, but in that chaos of the first few minutes when we pulled some of that stuff up, some of the construction workers kind of messed with some of it. But um, this whiskey decanter is pretty cool. We found quite a few wine bottles, um, quite a few alcohol bottles were present at the site. Um, looking more closely at gender, uh, these shoes are probably one of my favorites. Um, the woman's shoe is, is pretty interesting. We find several of those. You can see, you know, it's pretty narrow and thin. Um, but these shoes are pretty cool because they're a matching pair. Um, and so those are now, of course, I, I think they're on display at the Pioneers Museum right now. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about the exhibit that came out of this too. Of course, at last, um, we found quite a few bottles and jars and things that still had the lid on them, and we sent those off for analysis, too. I don't know that I have time to get into all that stuff, but pretty neat stuff and pretty good preservation. Uh, we were looking a little bit at age, too. Um, we find doll parts and things like that. One of my favorite, some of my favorite artifacts that come from this, too, are a children's tea set. So they're ceramic and everything, but they're they're pretty chunky, so they're real thick so that, you know, if they drop them, they're probably not going to break so easily. So we can see that too. So it wasn't only his three daughters that grew up on, on Glen Erie, but of course all of his workers and things too. So this is a picture of a school site, a school that he has that's still standing there on the property that he built for his oldest daughter. He did end up building one really close to where he was dumping trash actually um, for the neighborhood kids as well. And so that's a site that we still have that's preserved out there as well. We also, of course, wanted to look and see what kinds of things he was eating, uh, him and his estate. Um, we found some pretty, some of the pretty, you know, average stuff you'd see, beef and pork, um, sheep, goat. Um, I, it says here uh, there were 75 halibut skeletons. Um, the interesting things about those is we were assuming that he was bringing those from the East Coast because that's where the trains were coming from at that time. But I I all of these were, were looking like they, when, when we did the faunal analysis, I say we, but I know nothing about faunal analysis, but when, when Alpine did their faunal analysis, um, they actually uh, were able to see that the halibut and a lot of the oysters and things were actually coming from the West Coast, which is interesting. 
Um, this one is pretty cool, this little skull up here, the juvenile bobcat cranium with the bullet hole in it. And then we have this picture from the Pioneers Museum. Um, that's Palmer right there, um, posing, acting like he's he's shooting this bobcat. So is that the skull from this bobcat right here? I don't know, but it's a pretty neat picture and a pretty cool correlation. Um, over 3,000 animal remains between the two sites, um, but we were also looking at what he was eating. So there's there's turkeys that still live on site, bighorn sheep and things like that. I don't think we see, saw any bighorn sheep that they were eating, but definitely turkeys. They were definitely doing some hunting as well. So uh, we could see that too. The chicken eggshells are pretty interesting too. Just that they're still there in that little floodplain. Some of the kind of miscellaneous artifacts that were out there that were just interesting and kind of personal. Uh, the little oyster fork. So they were definitely eating quite a bit few oysters. Um, again, kind of speaks to that opulence and that wealth. And we're seeing those on the site, like I said, closer to the creek, that is the later site. Um, the, diff the different types of ceramics were pretty astounding as well. Um, there were just so many different types, which, which makes sense, I guess, if you're looking at it as an estate and not one household. Um, some of the ceramics like these here um, in the top left corner of the ceramics picture um, actually dated to about the 1700s. So they were probably heirloom. They were certainly heirloom even for uh, the Palmer family or whoever uh, owned them on his property. But uh, the different types of ceramics was really interesting. And that takes up a big part of the report, just talking about what types of ceramics were out there and the ages and the uh, different things that are represented there. Um, these little nail clippers are pretty interesting. I've never seen um, nail clippers in an archaeological context either. So um, they say clip clip company on them. It's kind of kind of a personal thing. Um, some of the art, some of the things that we are kind of left, you know, well, there's always mysteries in archaeology. We only have pieces of the puzzles. So um, we've got some pretty specific names and things that we weren't able to figure out. You think if you have a name and especially a picture and a name, you'd be able to figure it out. But some of them we don't. Um, this stamp here. Um, some sort of manager, what he was the manager of or why his stamp ended up in Palmer's trash, we're not sure. Um, that was not one that we were able to figure out. So if you want to do some research and figure that out for us, that would be great. Um, this guy, we found this on the on the site uh, on that first day, like I said, too. And we still haven't quite figured out who he is. Um, it has his name. So this is probably about the size of a quarter. Um, it's kind of that early cellulite type plastic and it's got this metal rim on the edge. Um, so it's probably some sort of campaign button or something. Um, that led me into a whole rabbit hole of how long campaign buttons have been around, things like that. You would have been probably pretty important if you had a campaign button made with your picture and your name on it at that time. Um, it says Thomas E. Kirby. On um, You can see the K-I-R-B down here in the corner. Um, there was some other wording up here that probably told us exactly who he was, but it's gone. Um, so that was a little frustrating. When I first found it, I thought, oh, we're definitely going to be able to look this guy up and figure out who he is. Um, but nobody's been able to do that. The closest I've come is this guy. This is a former governor of Alabama, um, but his name is Thomas E. Kilby. Um, did they spell his name wrong on, on a... Uh, on his own campaign button, I don't know. I think he looks pretty similar. Um, I think he's a little younger maybe in this picture. I think he looks pretty similar, but whether he's really the same guy or not, I'm not really sure. Um, he did have so, uh, some hand in some of the railroads too and some uh, ownership in some of the railroads. So maybe that was his connection to Palmer, but maybe it's not even him, I'm not even sure. Uh, when they went to actually go and build the detention pond, um, they found these, cir these circular features um, kind of just, a, you know, stains in the soil. They're all about the same size. Uh, when we excavated a couple of them, just did some experimental excavation of them, there were, we didn't see any artifacts in them. Um, there are quite a few of them. I think like over, I think there's around 50 to 60 of them. They're all in rows and evenly spaced. Um, and we just, we're not really sure what they are. So, um, our, our best theory is maybe an alien landing or something, but uh, we thought maybe like an orchard or something like that, but there's no real evidence of a root system or anything else. So 
those are confusing and will probably remain a mystery. Um, wrapping up Palmer a little bit here. So we, we did quite a bit of public engagement as well. That's something we're always trying to do. And of course, with archaeology, it can be pretty tricky to tell people about archaeological sites, especially when they're ongoing uh, or say they're going to remain there. But with this one, we knew that it was going to go away with that pond. The entire, uh, both of those sites are, are pretty much gone. And so uh, we felt like this would be a good way to, to involve the public. And so even with the snow and the rain and the sleet and things, um, Alpine was actually able to do a lot of the, uh, had tours come out with the Garden of the Gods Visitor Center um, and do some really cool public engagement and let people see what was going on and educate them about what was out there. Um, there is an exhibit at the Colorado Springs Pioneers Museum. It's a permanent exhibit. They were actually doing this exhibit um, before we found the site. Um, they were going to do an exhibit on Palmer because they have a lot of his um, his archival material and then they have a lot of artifacts that have been donated by the family as well. Um, they were doing that because 2021 was our sesquicentennial celebration. So our 150th celebration, um, Colorado Springs was founded on July 31st, 1871. And so um, leading up to that, we were doing a few celebrations and this exhibit was one of them. Um, and we were just able to give them a lot more material. And then we were able to talk a lot about um, how we use archaeology and how with that combined with the archival materials that we have and combined with um, museum collections could really tell a big piece of history and really tell people why we care about archaeology and why it's important. So that's the Palmer Project. Um, we're still doing a lot of public interpretation on it. Uh, we still need to get quite a few people together to really come through and look at more of the artifacts that we found and see if, see it, especially like the people that work at Glen Erie every day, see if we can get, um, or the people that really know Palmer, get more information out of this site. And I think I think that would be an interesting and fun thing to do in the future. We're just having a little bit hampered with COVID lately. But so moving on from the Palmer site, um, we're still in Garden of the Gods here. You can see these big uh, rock formations in the background of this picture here. This is the Fatty Rice site. So um, I'll tell you a little bit about the site. Um, and, and what we're doing out there. This site is right at the entrance of Garden of the Gods Park. So when you come into the park, um, there's, uh, you know, the road takes you right straight up to the, those formations and then you make a loop around the main part of the huge formations that stick out of the ground over there. Uh, when you're at that stop sign right there, if you look over to your, to your right, you'll see this big depression right there. And that is where the, the fatty rice site was. Um, there's, like I said, Garden of the Gods is always busy. It's always changing. There's always things going on. And knowing this site is right there and um, any change that they may make to the road or to the trails right there going in, uh, we wanted to have a good handle on what that site uh, was and where the boundaries were. So I was able to collaborate with UCCS and their field schools. So uh, Dr. Manette Church and Dr. Karen Larkin um, helped have helped for the past three years they taught their field schools out there and we've been able to collaborate. Um, looking for the site boundaries is, was our biggest um, goal at, at first. And then just learning a little bit about Fatty Rice and what he was doing out there. Um, look at different features and things like that too. And, and there's actually more than one occupation. So a little bit about Mr. Rice and his family. Um, my kids always tell me I shouldn't call him Fatty, but he named himself that. So his name was actually Edwin Rice. Um, he and his wife Phoebe had five children and they lived in Old Colorado City for many years and had a, a shop there and a, were selling beer and, and curios and things like that in Old Colorado City. In 1892, he purchased this property right there at the entrance of the park, probably a really coveted little piece of property at the time. Um, he purchased that property and then set up a curio shop. Um, and so his family lived there as well. So in this picture back here, um, you can see the road that goes right up to the front of the shop there. And then his house is, what we think is his house, is on the other side of the road there. So here we are looking at him and his family. You can see on the roof there, um, he's advertising malt tonic and iced milk and picnic lunches. Uh, he was brewing his own beer there. They were 
uh, carving gypsum figurines out of the gypsum that's found there in Garden of the Gods. Um, he had a pretty thriving business there, and it's one of the first examples that we have of tourism in Garden of the Gods Park. So we started excavating there uh, in 2019. That was Dr. Church's uh, field school. And our main goal then was to really figure out, like I said, the site boundaries and figure out what was going on. This big depression that I just talked about that you can still see there today, circled in blue right there, um, was we assumed that maybe it was part of the cellar or part of the foundation or something. Uh, Fatty Rice lived there. Like I said, he purchased it in 1892. He passed away in 1902, but his, his uh, wife, Phoebe, kept the property until she sold it to Palmer in 1907. Um, and it burned down just a couple of months after Palmer purchased it. So we actually see that burn line right here in this test unit here. We thought the first year we didn't have this picture down here. And so we thought it was part of the cellar. Um, it makes a whole lot more sense looking at here that it was actually a pond. So this white rock just behind that water feature there uh, that has the arrow pointing to it um, is a really good marker for us as well. That white rock, I don't know if you guys can see my mouse, but um, it's just above the blue circle kind of in these bushes here. Um, but you see different iterations of sheds coming off of it at various intervals um, throughout time. This picture was super helpful for us because um, we had different angles and of course we couldn't see all the outbuildings um, that first year. So we were just kind of trying to find, you know, basic information out. So we put a test unit along the side thinking that we might find a wall uh, that first year. And we put one in kind of in the middle of the pond and it turned out to be really rich in artifacts. It makes even more sense now that we know that it's a pond. Um, because what do people do with water? They throw trash in it, they throw bottle caps and coins and different things in it. Um, so that one turned out to be a really rich um, area for us to excavate. We also, the second year, uh, Karen Larkin and I were out there and we were looking um, at some of the, the vegetation and how it's kind of changed and seeing if we could see even like some of the change where like outside of that little yard that he has fenced off. And we noticed this little depression out here um, kind of near the windmill. And uh, we thought, well, yeah, this would be the ideal place for a privy. And turns out, yep, yeah, that's, that's exactly what it is. So we've excavated that for two seasons. Um, I think we're about two and a half meters down, well, probably closer to two meters down, um, and have really exposed uh, at least three sides of the rock wall that lined it. Um, and of course, what do people do with privies too? They throw their trash in there as well. So um, we're thinking that, um, you know, he was, people would pull up in the front of the shop. Um, they could use that privy. They were, they were probably tying their horses here to this water feature. Um, Cause like I said, it was still a pretty, pretty good distance from town at the time. And it would have definitely been a day trip to go out there. And that's why he was selling picnic lunches and beer and, and, you know, those kinds of things too. He was also advertising like Indian made baskets and blankets and things like that. So he, and you look him up in the newspaper, he's talking about his good trading relationships with the local Native Americans. And um, he probably had a pretty thriving business for quite some time. So some of the things we found out there, um, we did excavate too in some of those, you know, those outlying areas and things as well. Um, just this last year in 2021, uh, we excavated where we now know was definitely part of the cellar. Um, and it actually turned out to be kind of well-preserved little cavity in there. Um, and we were finding all kinds of things I'll talk about here in a sec. Um, a lot of these were found in the, the privy, the pond, and then also there's, there's a cistern there that's still capped off by a piece of rock. So we didn't actually have to excavate in there. We just had to send a student, a brave student down in there to start pulling things out. Um, some interesting things, you know, this, pretty pin. We found quite a few like cufflinks that have like a impression of a little girl on them. Um, this license plate doesn't look like you can read it, but you can when you're in person and it actually looks like it's probably from about the 1920s. So that's probably the, the second occupation. Um, we found parts of a, a Model A Ford in the cistern along with the license plate. Uh, we're finding oyster shells just like at the Palmer site. Um, 
some just you know some usual things like like little pieces of porcelain and things uh this tooth gave us a little bit of a scare uh <laughs> we we thought it was a real human tooth but it turns out to be an early denture tooth once we got it all cleaned up and looked at so uh, that was in the cistern as well uh, we're also of course looking we're not only looking for uh the evidence of early tourism and and you know the curio type stuff we're also kind of trying to see on the other side of the road if we could see fatty's family and uh, it turns out that we think what's happened is the uh, creek has kind of changed course right there, the little wash that comes through. And we think that actually probably cuts right through where the house was. So that's that's unfortunate, but um, we did find some pretty cool stuff. Uh, we're finding like mineral water that's probably from right there in Manitou Springs, which was really close. Um, this chunk of uh, stein handle is really big, really thick and probably went with something like this, which is probably the base of a stein or some sort of container. Um, it looked like it maybe had some sort of picture on the bottom, um, but it says part of the word gateway and part of Garden of the Gods. So the gateway formation is what you're right in front of when you're looking at, uh, when you're standing on the fatty rice site. Um, I mentioned earlier that there were carving things from gypsum. And so this little, uh, figurine foot with this little tassel on it is made of the local gypsum that we found in part of that stuff. Um, this year when we actually excavated in what we know is the cellar, we were finding things in various stages. So some raw materials, raw materials, so like big chunks of, of unmodified gypsum with um, different stages of carving, seeing with different types of shell where we could see the different stages of them storing it, but then also turning them into beads and things like that. Um, even some like um, semi-precious jewels were down in there. So it's interesting to see too what they lost in that fire and what was probably stored there in the cellar. Um, after Fatty Rice, um, there's a guy named Straussenbach. So Charles Straussenbach um, started the uh, trading company that's still there and, and run just outside of the south part of the park. Um, but he first... He actually started in the park um, selling lemonade and things when he was like nine years old. Um, and he had this building right here. Um, this is on the fatty rice site and see this, the, those formations come in really handy um, when you're trying to line up old historic pictures. Um, but he had this building in two different locations. So he had it here and he also had it in the central part of the park. And so uh, we know that he had that sometime there between 1917 and 1929. Um, we could see from the aerials, and then when we were out there on site, we could see um, part of this rock foundation and these walls that are lined up. And all of Fatty's buildings are kind of north-south, and this one's really crooked and off from those. So uh, we, we put a couple units in there trying to see if we could find some really um, definitive things that would tell us age or a different uh, purpose for that structure. Uh, unfortunately, we weren't really able to come up with a whole lot of things, but um, that building probably wasn't there for a whole lot, for a whole long time. Like I said, it, between 1917 and 1929, it was there for part of the time and then the other part of the park the other. So, um, but we're pretty sure just because of the way it's oriented and things that it is likely Straussenbach's um, residence. So it's been a, that's been a fun project to work on. Uh, let's see. There we go. And it's, it's been a good collaboration with UCCS as well, just because it um, gives me free labor. It gives them um, a learning experience. And it, it's it, those have been working with UCCS and Colorado College even a little bit has been really good experience for both of us, I think. All right, so getting out of Garden of God's Park, I know I've taken up quite a bit of time already. So um, we'll move on a little bit here. I know not all of you are super familiar with Colorado Springs and our parks and the different areas we have. So I'll kind of skim over some of these, but um, some of the projects that we're currently working on are just um, preliminary surveys of some of the bigger open spaces. Um, in order to do master planning, we always want to do um, surveys of those things. So we generally contract out for those. Um, we have a couple of them that are pretty unique. Um, Blue Stem Open Space is one that we have on the southeast side of town. Um, that has quite a bit of farming history and things like that. And so we're, we're looking at that type of stuff. It's never been surveyed. And so 
that's on the on the to-do list there. Uh, we're currently replacing some of the bridges in North Cheyenne Canyon. I don't know if any of you have ever been to North Cheyenne Canyon Park, but it is actually our oldest uh, park. I think it was, I don't want to say a date because I don't want to say it wrong, but um, it was actually first Colorado College Park, and it is in the southwest part of the city in a beautiful canyon, um, has a really long history, and um, those bridges, some of them are, are were built, you know, in the 18 in the late 1800s and then some of them have been replaced over time some of them are still intact and they have some really beautiful stonework um, but they need to be replaced because they're just not uh they're not doing well and they you know they can't get fire trucks across them and they don't trust them for fire trucks and things and there's lots of climbing in that park and so we definitely need you know emergency vehicle access there are people that live um in just past cheyenne canyon so um, doing, we're working with the Army Corps of Engineers and a few other agencies and trying to replace some of those. So that's another big project. Um, I was over there just the other day because we were looking at some of the rails they pulled out where they repurposed some of the short line railroad rails. Um, so we were looking for some uh, maker's marks and things like that on them. It's kind of hard to see because they've been painted over and things, but we were able to find one from 1912. So, um, you know, just interesting kind of fun things like that, that um, I don't have huge parts in, but um, get to do, you know, fun little field trips and things like that. Um, recently, our city utilities uncovered some of the old trolley tracks downtown. So, you know, getting to go kind of look at some of those and take some pictures and document them in that way. Um, Monument Valley Park is actually um, a miles long kind of corridor right in the central part of the city. And that was one of Palmer's um, babies when, at the time, it was one of the very first parks that was put um, in the city. And we have a lot of really cool and interesting um, stonework that was put there in the 1930s by the Works Project Administration. And so some of that's being restored and things. So I've done a lot of monitoring and consultation for that as well. Uh, I talked a little bit about Corral Bluffs, uh, the two pictures, the one on the middle and then the, the projectile point there on the bottom right um, are at Corral Bluffs. Corral Bluffs, um, well, like its name suggests, is a really cool bluff area that's just east of town. Um, still, I think it's within Colorado Springs limits, but um, it's a really unique, um, it's, a, it's just a unique place. The, the bluffs themselves are really unique, but uh, the different resources that would have been out there, um, it's really close to our other park property, Jimmy Camp, which is this little oasis of trees. It's like a little mini forest right next to Corral Bluffs. And so Corral Bluffs is pretty famous right now for the paleontology that we find out there. We're right above the KT boundary out there. And so we're we're looking at stuff that happened right after the, the mass extinction. Um, and so we've got some world-class paleontology out there. So the Denver Museum of Nature and Science comes out there very frequently. They've found some world-class paleontology that they don't see anywhere else in the world right now. Um, some of the very first mammals that survived that asteroid impact are out there. Um, we've got, you know, perfectly preserved, beautiful leaves out there. Uh, we've got palm wood. Um, so it's about 65 million years that you're looking at out there, 67 million years. Um, really cool stuff. And there's actually a Nova episode called Rise of the Mammals, if you're interested in looking at that, that's all about Corral Bluffs and the unique paleontology that's out there. And there's also a display at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science out there too. So check that out if you're interested. Um, between Jimmy Camp and Corral Bluffs, there are um, so far documented, and it was surveyed, uh, I think in 1986, and then a little bit more in the 90s. My first ever excavation out there um, was in, it was 20 years ago now, uh, in 2002 was out at Jimmy Camp excavating a really cool site. Um, there are 497 archeological sites and isolated finds between the two properties and they're pretty small in acreage. So uh, the density of sites out there is really unique and really important. Um, I think like 140 of those sites are, are eligible for the National Register of Historic Places. Um, so lots of, lots of different and really cool archeology span that probably speaks a lot to um, subsurface context and things like that out there, pre-European contact archaeology. So, and then we've got, you know, the archaeology that goes all the way up into like 
homesteading and cattle ranching and all kinds of things out there. Um, we recently did a full archaeological survey of Austin Bluffs open space. Um, we've got that place is pretty significant for the tribes as well. Pulpit Rock, if you're familiar at all uh, with, with that area, is over there too. Um, we've got sheep herding activity. A lot of like low rock walls are still there. Uh, we even have a possible eagle trap out there. Um, so we've done quite a bit of consultation for that property and that kind of surrounds the UCCS property. So that was another collaboration I was able to do with them to look at that as a whole cultural um, landscape. Um, little other things like, you know, graffiti removal consultation when people are sp spray painting over some of our historic graffiti um, is, you know, just little things like that that I do a lot. Um, one of our park properties had called Red Rock Open Space um, has some of the remnants of the Colorado Philadelphia Reduction Works. So that was a big part of Colorado Springs history. They were mining gold and things from the Cripple Creek area, um, but we had the coal um, to, to process all that ore. So they were hauling it from Cripple Creek to Colorado Springs to process it. And so we still have like a big uh, chlorination, like the, a big hole for chlorination tanks and water tanks over there in Red Rock Canyon and um, trying to preserve those and interpret them as well. Um, let's see, lots, like I said uh, before, lots of consultation and collaboration with the Colorado Springs Pioneers Museum on a lot of their projects. We're currently redoing the Native American exhibit at, at the museum. And so we are closely consulting with all three Ute tribes. Uh, we recently started talking with the Northern Arapaho as well. And you know, the goal of that is really to tell their history and their from their perspective, um, their creation story, the way they want it told. Um, so that's been a fun and interesting project and I've learned a lot on that as well. Um, we've also got a bunch of really small open spaces that are, um, itty bitty ones that, but there's archeology span everywhere. So if you look, you'll find it for the most part. So some of the upcoming work, um, I wanna do a full survey of Garden of the Gods Park. The entire park has never been surveyed. Um, and so that'll also involve a lot of tribal consultation. Um, this project here, um, we recently started and it's ongoing. It's, a, it's an expansion of the road in front of Garden of the Gods Park, but it impacts the park. And so we've done, been doing a lot of tribal consultation for the last four years on that with the Southern Ute and the Ute Mountain Ute. So this is Terry Knight and Cassandra Atencio. Uh, Terry came up to do a blessing for us back in August ahead of the project. Um, so that's been a fun project to work on. I've definitely learned a lot about that one too. Uh, we want to revisit a lot of the sites at Jimmy Camp Park. That's the one near Corral Bluffs. Um, just because it's, it's, I always tell people those two sites combined are pretty overwhelming when you go out there. It's like, where do you start? There's just so much archaeology and it's all so significant. So um, that's something that we want to do here in the near future as well. Uh, we're also trying to connect Corral Bluffs and Jimmy Camp along that whole bluff area. So there will be a lot of survey of those new acquisitions. And, you know, we're always pushing stewardship and tribal consultation. So uh, we're acquiring these properties and our big push is to really steward them. And that, of course, includes all the cultural and uh, archaeological resources out there. And we're always trying to push to the public. My, my main thought with public archaeology is people tend to really like archaeology. And so uh, trying to get all that out there and really connect people to the archaeology and connect them to these places my goal is to get them to care more about them so that they take care of them better. So, yep, so we're pretty busy, but uh, that, that's what I've got for now. So that was pretty long, but let me know if you have any questions. All right, I was busy writing questions. Um, thank you so much for that talk, Anna. Sure. Um, I think virtual round of applause, even though you can't hear it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so if you are willing, I think we have a chat box that is plumb full of questions. Um, so if you'd like to read through them. That might be <laughs> okay. Let me see if it or better than me reading through them. <laughs> Let's see. Let me see if I can scroll through them.
And if there are additional questions, um, if y'all want to either raise your hands, put it in the chat box, or just pipe up, I'm sure we can uh, be informal about this. Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, let's see. The first one I see here is uh, for the Palmer site. Were there any non-commercially preserved food items? Um, do you mean like canned foods, things like that? Basically, yes. We definitely see um, evidence of like, like we see the, the jar liners and mason jars and things like that out there. So I'm sure they were doing quite a bit of that, especially, uh, you know, like I said, he had extensive gardens and greenhouses as well. So I'm sure, sure they were doing that kind of stuff too. Um, we were trying to really look and see, you know, how self-sustaining they were because even then they were pretty far away from town. So, uh, I mean, I guess two to three miles isn't crazy long, but when you've got a horse or a wagon and no roads um that's that's pretty pretty long way so i'm sure they were doing some of that out there we definitely see a lot of those milk glass uh lid liners for those jars mm -hmm. um interested in availability preference. go ahead well i was just going to ask about any like commercially preserved foods like with that halibut did it come fresh or was it like smoked or some other preservation method well, that's a great question i assume it probably came on ice um there's a lot of talk in some of palmer's uh, journals and different things like that about his ice box and um really wanting to to have refrigerated trains and things like that too so um yeah that's an interesting question but i don't know that i can really answer it but <laughs> okay i i think it's kind of a unique position in time um and space because you've got the availability um of like continental travel for these luxury goods and right. i was i was just wondering if there's like a preference to to focus on that kind of conspicuous consumption or i don't know or live more locally it sounds yeah. like it's kind of a bit of everything yeah i think um he's definitely eating like i said some of the the local game and things too they're definitely hunting and doing some of that stuff too, but it's not nearly as prevalent as like, you know, your domesticated animals that, that they were eating out there. So like I said, lots of chicken eggshells, um, beef, pork, chicken. Um, but the wild game is, is not, is not making up as much of their diet as, as the, the domesticated things out there. Okay. Cool. Not that, that that's sense. not necessarily what you asked, but <laughs> Um, are there Palmer no, descendants? There. Uh, there are Palmer, Palmer descendants. None of them that we know of really live in Colorado Springs anymore. Um, he had three daughters. One of them had tuberculosis and his youngest daughter had tuberculosis. Um, so I don't know that she went on to get married. I probably should know a little bit more about his daughters, but um, they did get married. They did live in Colorado Springs for quite a while. Um, they sold the property, like I said, only a few years after he passed away. So um, but I don't know that there, there's a whole lot of them that live in Colorado Springs, but the, I know that the people at the Pioneers Museum are still in contact with a lot of those descendant groups. Same with actually uh, Fatty Rice's descendants. Um, when we were excavating out there the very first year, some guy pulled up on the sidewalk where you're not supposed to pull up in Jeep, and he was, he was his great-grandson. So, um, so cool. He actually invited us over to his house, and we looked at some of the, his old pictures and different things, and we're still trying to convince him to come into the Colorado Springs Pioneers Museum and show us some of the things he's got and tell us some stories, but yeah. Yeah, that, that'd be a great oral history. Right, yeah. Let's see, next question. Uh, how do you check out any LIDAR? Um, we did, we had, um, Aaron Acosta with DU. He's a grad student at DU um, under Bonnie, I believe, um, came out and he did ground penetrating radar for us on the site. And so that's, we really were looking, like I said, on the other side of the road to see if we could find the house foundation. And we think we do see one edge of it, but the creek has seemed to has washed away the rest of it, unfortunately. So um, but yeah, we were able to see some pretty interesting things. You can definitely see um, changes where there were some different buildings and fence lines and things like that out there. We've done LIDAR a little bit out there between Fatty Rice and um, the Palmer Mid-In site. Uh, I mentioned there's a schoolhouse site that was built there in 1889. 
And we've done some LIDAR out there with UCCS, um, but we haven't gotten the results of those back yet, so. Okay. I wonder even if like the one meter DMs that USGS probably has posted for Colorado Springs would have any like foundations footprints. We do, visible. we actually have quite a few um, aerials. That's one of the advantages of uh, being a military town. We've got aerials starting in 1947. And so we see some of the foundations, especially of like that Straussenbach place. Cool. So that's been, that's been fun to look at. Um, let's see what else we got here. Throwing things in ponds, yeah. So we find quite a bit of coins. Uh, what we find the most probably in there is bottle caps, which makes sense, right? You're standing there, you're having a beer, standing next to your horses or whatever, and you're flicking your bottle caps into the pond. Um, but there's also some pretty interesting things like hairpins and you know just all kinds of things in there. There's even a water feature, what we think it might be a water feature, further up the hill, pretty far away from the fatty rice site. Uh, when the park ranger told me about it the first time, he told me that somebody said it was a Kiva. I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> um, but there's a kind of a, a rectangular structure that they dug into the side of the hill up there. We think maybe it was a water catchment feature, but we excavated the whole thing. Um, and well, we excavated all the way down to a plaster lining and we didn't find a single artifact, just really thin layers of it washing down from the hill, so. Hmm. Let's see. Do you think there are differences in assemblages between public privies like this and private privies? That's a good question, and that's something that we've thought about too, is there, was there a privy that was for um, the Rice family across the street, or, you know, were they, they probably weren't walking all the way over there in the middle of the night um, if they weren't living there. We're actually not even positive that we know Fatty owned that property, but uh, we're not even positive that that's where his family lived. Maybe they, we don't know, maybe they lived in the curio shop itself. So that would be something maybe, like I said, the descendants or somebody could answer as well. But um, yeah, that when we've done shovel testing and the ground penetrating radar on the other side of the road, uh, we don't see a whole lot there. So it's a little bit confusing. It's an interesting site. Yeah. Is the denture tooth a real tooth? It's plastic, thankfully. So. Weird. <laughs> cool. <laughs> um, <laughs> Becca, that was a fun phone call. <laughs> uh, let's see. How big were the mysterious circular features at the Palmer Midden? Were there any stones in the features when you dug them? We only excavated a couple of them because that was when we were actually monitoring them digging for the pond and they had just graded right there. Um, but we didn't find any artifacts in there. They didn't go very deep. Um, they were probably about, uh, I would say 70 centimeters across and pretty circular. Um, like I said, there was about 60 of them and they were all kind of in rows. So that one's pretty confusing. I don't really, I don't know. I know that he was planting lilac bushes out there at one point. So maybe it was the holes they dug for that, but I, without any artifacts, you know, what can you say? So. It's a pretty big hole for planting most things. I mean, right. you're planting a, unless you're planting trees, I mean, I guess lilacs, you might plant something that big, but that's a big hole. I, right. I was asking about size and stones because a lot of stones for posts and other things like that that are structural have packing right. stones packed in there that aren't artifacts in themselves but they stick them around whatever they were holding so, right yeah yep so I, I was just wondering what what if there were any kind of things in there that might help indicate what it was right yeah but, yeah we went out and looked and you know we we poked around at them and you know we uh, didn't excavate even close to all of them but because it was an ongoing construction project but uh, yeah, one of the, the great mysteries of the Palmer site. So if anybody has any good ideas, let me know. Um, let's see. How do you fund archaeological surveys? How are cultural resources incorporated into master planning exercises by parcel or throughout the entire system? So um, we actually fund a lot of our own uh, surveys. Uh, we haven't yet applied for grants or things like that. Um, some of them we've taken from like 
general fund money, um, but a lot of them, I mentioned that the TOPS program. So it's a, we can only spend money on TOPS related properties and things like that, but those TOPS uh, properties are the ones that are often not yet surveyed or haven't had anything done on them and haven't had master plans. Um, and there's, there's, at least in recent years, there had been quite a bit of funding in those in those uh, pots. So we were able to to do those in that way too. Um, we have private funding for the um, Garden of the Gods survey that we want to do. Um, so uh, yeah, I think it just kind of depends. And then and we're we're generally trying to um, survey the, in, the entire property so that we know what we can and can't do and what we can and can't touch out there for those kinds of things. And, and, you know, we contract those out because I'm only one person and it would take me forever and I've got other things to do too, so. <laughs> um, Any geophysics planned for those surveys? Um, I think the only geophysics that I've seen done is generally ahead of like construction projects and things. And since we're not really generally constructing things on our open spaces, um, you know, when, when they're like, say, say right now in Garden of the Gods, they're expanding the road that goes in front of it. Um, they've done a lot of geophysics because they're putting like a small detention pond in there, um, utility lines, um, looking at like runoff and different things like that. But in general, I don't, I don't know. Don't think we've done a whole lot of that stuff. But it'd be nice, but. Um, Mag survey would be very nice there, particularly Garden of the Gods. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a, all kinds of resources on you know those types of properties. Uh, does CCC have staff that handle historic preservation exclusively? Um, mm, I mean, I guess I, I guess the Colorado Springs Pioneers Museum it would would be the closest thing that we have that fulfills that role. Um, so I'm the only archeologist, um, my supervisor is a historian. So, uh, you know, we work pretty closely uh, with them and then, um, you know, rely on a lot of like reports and things like that. But you don't have to go do like historic architectural inventories and-, uh, and We, and we like contract that. that stuff out, yeah. We don't have an nice. architectural historian on staff, so. So recently my, my supervisor um, was on medical leave for quite a while. And so I had to do some of his job. And so some of them that did involve that historic architecture, I was very clear that archeologists are not, <laughs> not the same thing. And so I don't know if I should be making some of these decisions. So it was a lot of um, consultation too with like um, SHPO staff and stuff like that for those types of things. Yeah. Do your parks have yeah. any historic buildings that you have to preserve and protect? Uh, yeah, we have quite a few. Um, our open spaces, not so much, but um, so, for example, the Colorado Springs Pioneers Museum is in is in a park. Um, a park surrounds it, I guess, and we have like uh, like the building itself um, was the original courthouse in Colorado Springs. Um, so that's one of our, you know most important and significant buildings that that's under Parks and Rec. Uh, we have several gazebos and um, things like that that are in some of the older parks and bandstands and things like that. So yeah, we have, we have some. Uh, let's see. Can you see the glass rain horizon on the KT at Corral Bluffs? Um, I think we're actually just above that. We're a little too far above that to see that um, on the ground out there. I mean, I've heard that there are some parts out there that you can see the actual KT boundary, but um, I think for the most part, um, we're a little higher than that. So, and like I said, if, if, if you want to watch a really interesting and fun Nova pro um, special look at, um, look at Rise of the Mammals, it's a really, it's a really cool program and it's really, really cool to see what they're finding out there and why it's so unique. Favorite, least favorite, weirdest parts of the job. <laughs> uh, if you could snap your fingers and change one thing about it, what would that be? Uh, I'd like more help. That would be nice. Um, I would like to not be the only archeologist 
I'd like to actually lead someone maybe or <laughs> um, more help would be would be nice. Um, I started out as a uh, part time position. So it was like 29 hours a week, no benefits uh, that luckily only lasted a few months before I was able and I found a Palmer site um, only three months into the job. So um, that was a pretty good job security and a, a pretty good reason to to to, you know, convince them to let me stick around. Um, so, um, yeah, it's definitely evolved and changed. And um, I also work quite a bit with even like outside of Parks and Rec. I, I help a little bit. I try not to get too involved with like our planning department and our engineering department and stormwater uh, when they're doing other projects um, or like just need access to things like Compass, um, the state's database for sites and things like that. So. Um, helping them navigate like the section 106 process and, and negotiate and talk with Shippo and things like that. So um, my favorite part, I mean, I really like the tribal consultation. I learn uh, quite a bit with the tribal consultation. Um, and it's always just a fun experience and fun, you know, relationships that are built with those types of things. Um, least favorite, I, I think, I think what's unique a little bit to municipal archaeology that's um, maybe not so prevalent in like your basic CRM, although I wouldn't say it's completely ruled out, is there's a lot of politics involved. Um, so that's not my most favorite part of it, but um, it's been some pretty big lessons in diplomacy and, um, you know, dealing with especially like the, the public that finds, finds a political reason to argue with you and different things too. So um, I'd like talking with the public. It's... Um, it's been interesting and kind of fun um, in a lot of ways. Um, but, you know, of course, there's always some ne negative experiences to any job. Uh, weirdest part. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Hmm, that's a good question. I don't have to think about that. <laughs> hmm. Or maybe like coolest site you think or coolest finding. I don't know. Yeah. Um, I was still, when people ask me what my, what the coolest artifact I've ever found, kids ask that a lot. Um, I tell them about the very first artifact I found as an archaeologist was out at Jimmy Camp. So it's now a property that I manage. Um, but as you know, a 19 year old student out there, um, my first excavation, uh, Bill Arbogast was teaching it and he said that whoever found the first diagnostic artifact on site, would get a six pack. Um, well, me and my partner found a piece of woodland, Plains woodland pottery. <laughs> and uh, we were 19, we were both 19 at the time. So we got a six pack of lemonade. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> not only was it the first artifact that I found, um, but it, when we got it back into the lab um, and kind of cleaned it up and everything, you could see the person's fingerprints on the inside of that piece oh, of wow. ceramic. And like, that's so personal and so cool. Um, I think, I think what I really like about the job is, um, you know, I have indigenous roots too. Um, my dad is part Navajo and Apache. And so just knowing that like, you know, some of my ancestors were probably there and, and maybe I'm the first indigenous person to touch these things. Um, first person, you know, and I think that with all archeologists, like you're the first person to maybe see these things or touch them for, you know, thousands or hundreds of years. And that's a, pretty cool thing. But I also just really like being out there and, you know, you can kind of just feel sometimes that energy in these places that are pretty untouched. And I think it's just really cool. And it's a, it's a good connection. And, and I like telling, I like talking about archaeology, as you can see too. So um, it's fun to talk to people and educate them about archaeology and, and what it is with, that us archaeologists do and why it's important. And yeah, it's a good job. I really like it. <laughs> It sounds pretty awesome. Any other questions? Oh, Justin's mentioning our dog skeletons. So uh, in 2015, when I was still with UCCS, we excavated um, with some a field school. We excavated in the central part of Garden of the Gods, and we came down on. Uh, we were excavating the site that actually seems to date from at least about 3,500 years ago. Um, and there was, you know, a lot of stuff on top of all that too. Um, a lot of really interesting 
archaeology that really speaks to tourism um, and like, you know, picnicking and things like that. But we found two dog burials um, that were probably from about the 1960s. So <laughs> possibly not the coolest archaeological find I've ever, <laughs> I've ever seen, but it was fun. Justin was one of the students out there. And so got to dig some of that stuff. <laughs> I mean, it's 50 years old, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> bizarre I never considered pet burials yeah <laughs> and it makes sense at a place like Garden of the Gods right that's yeah <laughs> makes you wonder how many people do that kind of thing or spread ashes or things like that yeah I I'm sure it's a very high rate <laughs> you know the folks definitely do that with the flat irons and boulder yeah, the next question is, is how does that impact our uh, future DNA analyses when you uh, spread ashes all over these important places? <laughs> Ooh. I don't know. You're probably ruining a lot of the DNA by <laughs> incinerating it, but still, yeah, definitely we're, would we're make it DNA unique. DNA out of soil. So. <laughs> right. If we're pulling DNA out of soil from sites, it, it kind of makes you wonder. True. And that's now. Imagine twenty years from now. What we're... <laughs> any other questions? Thanks everyone for listening and paying attention. It was good to talk to you guys. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm Thank glad you. we were able to do this. Thank you for for talking to us. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And hopefully we'll see you around. Yeah. Maybe we can do like a site visit or something someday. Oh, yeah.